Hello. Hi. Welcome to Drinking the Kool-Aid. Welcome. I'm Megan. I'm Hannah. And today is part two of our story on Ellen Greenberg. And I watched Gavin Fish's YouTube videos. And I also listened to the Prosecutor's Podcast, which was a five-part series, and Big Mad True Crime Podcast. Recap of part one. Is this case a suicide or murder? Ellen Greenberg's class got out early on January 26th of 2011 because there was a blizzard heading their way. After all of her students were gone, she gassed up her vehicle and headed back to her apartment. Her fiancé, Sam Goldberg, went to the gym in their apartment complex at 4.45. When he returned about 30 minutes later, the door was locked with the swing bar latch, so he was not able to get in. He went down to the first floor to ask the security guard for help, but it was against their policy to break the door down, so... Sam said that he broke it down on his own, and that's when he found Ellen dead on the kitchen floor. The police did not believe there was a sign of a struggle or a break-in, so they worked the case as a suicide. But Ellen had 20 stab wounds. The medical examiner ruled her death as a homicide, but the scene had not been secured, and they lost valuable evidence. And then... On March 7th of 2011, the medical examiner's office overturned Ellen's death to a suicide, citing her alleged mental health struggles and the fact that she was found in a locked apartment with no signs of a struggle. Her parents were stunned by this ruling, and they decided to hire their own medical experts, lawyers, and law enforcement officials to look at Ellen's case. They requested all documents, but the police refused to send anything. They finally allowed the Greenbergs to view the evidence, but they weren't allowed to bring an attorney or any other experts. No photos were allowed, and they couldn't call to discuss the files with anyone. That is where we left off in the first episode. Guy Deandra wanted to find the forensic neuropathologist report that the detective said was done on Ellen's spinal cord because it was the reason the case was closed, closed and changed to a suicide. But the report couldn't be found. The police didn't have it, and the medical examiner didn't have it. For real? Yeah. The forensic pathologist said... Not only did she not have the report, she never saw the specimen. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, She did say there, you know, is a remote possibility that it was shown to her, but it's not something that she has any recollection of. There was no bill on file for this report either. So does that I mean, mean it doesn't exist? Pretty <laughs> solid. But... Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, I do appreciate the fact that she's like, okay, you know, listen, there's a small remote possibility, but, you know. No, I, I actually respect the hell out of that because I have to say that shit all the time. Yeah. I'm like, um, I'm fairly positive, but there is a small possibility because I have a terrible memory. Yeah. So, I mean, I do appreciate that. But, I mean, if there's no report, you don't remember ever looking no, at this specimen. Solid. And yeah. there's no bill for the report. That's pretty solid right there. I think we know what's going on here. Esteemed forensic pathologist Cyril Wecht, who disputed the single bullet theory of John F. Kennedy's assassination, and Henry Lee, the forensic scientist who testified on behalf of O.J. Simpson's defense, both authored independent reports questioning the manner of Ellen's death. Whoa. Yeah, and so they both came to the very same conclusion. Ellen's death appeared suspicious, and they believed that it was consistent with a homicide. Before I read some of the statements, I want to mention that Ellen's stab wounds are labeled as letters of the alphabet. So that's going to be what Cyril is referencing in his quote. And then we're going to go through all of the stab wounds later on. So okay. it is going to make sense. Got it. 
Cyril Weck's report mentions that, quote, suicidal stab wounds can rarely be multiple. Suicides by stabbing are becoming less frequent, with simpler choices being drugs, hanging, or gunshot. Cutting of the wrist and throat is often associated with suicide, whereas stab wounds to the back are unlikely to be suicide. A murder usually involves multiple stab wounds to the side, back, or stomach. In a suicide, there may be additional cuts across the wrist or tentative stabbings to see if it'll hurt or to try to work up the courage. Then there will usually be one wound and most likely in the chest. The multiple stab wounds to the back of the upper neck and lower head found at autopsy were unlikely suicidal stab wounds, especially the different directions that K, L, Q, R, and S, with vertical direction left to right, straight vertical of M, N, and T, and right to left, horizontal, O, and vertical P. The locations of the stab wounds high up on the back of the neck and lower back of the head are also unlikely for self-inflicted wounds. I will stop here just to mention with these stab wounds, he is referencing that um, the the wounds are changing direction. So the knife is changing direction as it goes along. Okay, so you're saying it's not just like as if it were to be like held in a hand like in a fist and just like boom, boom, boom. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, so it's actually like where she, if she was doing it herself, she would literally need to pause and change and positions. Yes. Um, so then he goes on to say, quote, a suicide victim will frequently leave a note. There was none. There was also no indication that the decedent was suicidal from the standpoint of her own family, friends, professional associates, and the psychiatrist who had evaluated her. There had not been any indication that she had the intention to commit suicide or was depressed during the day she was found dead. She seemed her usual self in the morning when she had a telephone conversation with her mother and later at midday during her texting with a friend at approximately noon. It would be important to find out from her fiancé how she behaved barely half an hour before when he left their apartment as he claimed. A suicide victim will rarely stab herself through her clothing. Instead, she will open her shirt to expose the skin. Stabbing through clothing may indicate homicide. It is not known if fingerprints on the knife were taken and examined. Following the review of all the submitted documents, the results of the autopsy and the accounts from the investigation, based upon reasonable degree of medical certainty, it is my professional opinion that the manner of the death of Ellen Greenberg is strongly suspicious of homicide. There were some good points made in there. Very, very good valid I points. I didn't even think about the clothes thing until you started talking about it. And then I was like, holy shit, that makes sense. It's something that, you know, technically, I, I don't want to say like I knew that because I don't think I knew that exact fact. However, when we do hear about suicides in that manner, they do lift up their clothing typically. Right. So it makes sense. Now, here is some of the information that was in Henry Lee's report. He says, quote, After review of the photographs and reports sent to the Henry Lee Institute of Forensic Science, the following were observed. Um, and he has several bullet points that we're going to go through. So the first one, he's talking about photograph one, which shows a view of the door leading into the residence with security lock visible. Some damage appears to be in the area of the lock in the close-up photograph. There does not appear to be damage to the door jam or evidence of the break-in at the deadbolt lock from the other side of the door. So, you know, we had talked about in the first episode that Sam Goldberg said he broke down the door. But there's yep. no damage to the lock, which is something that you would expect to see. Like at all? Okay, so I viewed the photographs, and I, I do have this um, as a discussion point later. However, when I looked at it, you can see that 
it might be like slightly bent, but it also looks like it's just kind of bent from like use. Wear and tear from yes. you opening and shutting a door. Yeah. And then the screws were not all the way screwed in. That's it. And mm. there's no damage to the door whatsoever or okay. the door jam. You wouldn't expect that. No. I mean, when you're putting force into well, it. Well, especially the door jam, if that was. You're talking like the lock, it's like the lock on it? Or, yeah. yeah. So the lock somehow just pops open when he pushes against the door and nothing is broken in the process. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely weird. So, I, I mean, it is, it's strange. And so that's what he's referencing in here. And then he goes on to make another good point. He says, from the the door, when the door is locked with that swing lock, and slightly opened because, you know, you can kind of see a few inches in um, when that lock is engaged. He says a person can be seen on the floor in the corner of the kitchen cabinets. So Sam should have been able to see Ellen. Interesting. I mean, it does. They do open. A good amount. You, you can get an you eyeball put, in like, there. You can kind of put some fingers in there. Well, no, you definitely can put fingers in there because, yeah. like, I've been thinking about this the whole time. I'm sure that, like, there was, I guess, I don't know if you looked at the lock on there, but, I mean, literally, like, a majority of those, if there's no other lock on the door, you can just reach your hand in and pop it open. Yeah. So. And that's actually one of the things that I have in here as well. And we'll bring it up, um, you know, probably in another episode where I have it. Oh, cool. Because that's been on my mind like the whole time. But you're correct. You can open those. I've done it. And it's very easy. Right. I hate to say it, but it, it is. is easy. No, I've totally done it at a hotel before. And Not because I was breaking into anybody's room, but because, yeah. <laughs> but because they forgot to like take the lock off. But mm -hmm. um. It's not it's complicated. It's not difficult. You literally just crack the door and yeah, pop your fingers across it and it comes right up open. So, I mean, and even if he can't get his fingers in there, like there are things that you can use 100% to open it. Right. You just need something that can push it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like so, wait, we're going to talk about this later. We are. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cuz then I'll get more. Okay, I'll get more into it then. Perfect. Okay. All right, so the second thing he says is the view of the decedent in photo number two shows a female on the kitchen floor with her head and shoulders against the corner cabinets near the stove and sink. A pair of glasses are on the floor near Ellen's right hand. Blood-like stains are seen on the floor and on her clothing. A white towel is in her left hand. Several blood-like stains appear to be on the kitchen counter near the sink. A close-up view of her head and shoulders is seen in photo three and shows a knife in her upper left chest. There are blood-like stains on the knife, her face, and her clothes. There appear to be several cuts on her head. The blood is flowing in different directions on her face. This could mean that she was moved after receiving the initial bleeding injuries to her head. The location of several wounds would be difficult for her to cause the wounds herself. Like, the positioning is very, very difficult. In photo four, it shows Ellen's upper body and the cabinets are behind her. There are swipe-type patterns that can be seen on the cabinet corner area. There are also some blood spatter patterns and a blood dripping downward direction on the uh, cabinet to her right. These stains indicate that she received some of the wounds while she was above the level of the stains. The swipe patterns are consistent with having been formed when she fell to the floor. Photo 5 shows her middle torso and lower arms. There are at least 300 to 400 blood drops on her right or I'm sorry, on her upper thighs and waist area. These stains are consistent with vertical blood drops formed when blood fell from her wounds onto this area while she was in the sitting position. There is also blood on the floor between her legs. Based on the appearance of the blood stains and their location, locations, 
These are consistent with the knife being inserted at the area where she was found. She later fell onto the floor with the dripping wounds over her legs. Some blood-like stains are seen on her right hand. No defensive type wounds can be seen. And I know some of this is a little confusing, but we will break it down no, more. No, I was I was actually doing pretty okay with it. Perfect. Okay. Um number 6 is Ellen's lower extremities are shown in photo in the photo 6. Multiple blood drops are seen on the upper legs with additional drops noted on the lower legs and on the boot tops. A closer view of the left boot, which is photo 7, shows several vertical blood drops on the boot top and the sides of the boot sole. Some of these stains appear to be the result of vertical blood drops. Based on the number and distribution of the drops, these stains are consistent with having been from her initial injuries. If she received a massive injury while upright, the number of stains should have been greater. Ellen's right hand and the area around her right hand is in photo 8, and there is a blood smear on her right hand. A few blood drops can be seen on the floor, which might indicate that she was upright for some of her injuries. And there's no indication that the area had been cleaned up. Photo 9 is a close-up view of the bloodstains on the cabinet near Ellen's head. Several bloodstains are dripping downward, indicating that she was upright when she received some of the wounds. A small amount of cast-off type bloodstains are in the area of the cabinets, also indicating a downward direction. Photo 10 is a reddish-colored stain on the counter. It's unknown if it's blood, but if it is, it's consistent with some spatter, indicating that she was upright during some of the injuries, then fell to the floor and leaned against the cabinets. Photo 11 is the inside of the sink. There's two knives and a wash brush in the sink. Photo 12 shows cut-up fruit and other knives that are on the counter. And the last one is um, Ellen received multiple stab wounds to the chest, abdomen, neck, and scalp. She also had multiple contusions on her upper and lower extremities in various stages of healing. So these are all of the different things that he is reviewing in these photographs. Something about the cut-up fruit is just so, like, sad because it's like a normal thing. I you know what I mean? I am telling you right now, be prepared, get geared up, because I'm going to harp on that fruit like no other. Oh. I have a lot of feelings about this fruit, so. Oh, okay. And we're going to get to it. I didn't know that I, uh, what can of worms I was opening here, yeah. but. No, I just, like, it just, I guess it just uh, strikes me because I'm, like, it's just such a normal it is. thing. Mm -hmm. And, like, I don't know, why would you... Mm. It doesn't make sense. And there's a lot of things, a lot of feelings that I have surrounding okay, I'm that glad specific you detail. Yeah, I'm glad you understood where I was going with that yeah. because I was sitting here, like, oh, I'm not even sure how to word this at this point. But, yeah, um, yeah it is, like... Aside from that, it is very weird, like, it being such a normal thing in such a chaotic situation. Right. And just, like, something you would see every day. It just, ugh. Yeah, just chopped fruit waiting yeah. there. Yeah. Now, assuming that all of the blood in the photos is Ellen's, the bloodstained patterns indicate that she was standing where she received her initial injuries. And this caused the blood dripping on the sink, counter, cabinet, and floor. She was on the floor with her head leaning forward, producing the blood drops on her pants and between her legs. There were two contact stains on the cabinet near her, and this would be consistent with a wipe from right to left. And the second swipe is consistent with like a hair swipe. And he writes, quote, the number and type of wounds and bloodstain patterns observed are consistent with a homicide scene. So now we've got two very big experts concluding the same exact thing here. Okay. One of the primary reasons the detectives ruled Ellen's death as a suicide was due to the lack of defensive wounds found on her body. Tom Brennan, a retired state trooper and a former detective who also represents the Greenbergs, 
says that theory just isn't airtight, and a lack of self-defense wounds doesn't necessarily mean her injuries were self-inflicted. He said it's possible that Ellen was taken by surprise when she was stabbed, and he referred to this as a, quote, blitz attack, which would have left her defenseless, and it could explain the lack of struggle or defensive wounds that we're seeing. He says, quote, the victim is taken by surprise and doesn't have the opportunity to defend themselves. They are confronted unexpectedly. Tom Brennan is a member of Philadelphia's crime-solving organization, the VDOC Society. The society serves law enforcement nationwide, and they provide pro bono expert assistance to the law enforcement community in solving their cold case homicides. They do not conduct independent investigations. They will only help if law enforcement agencies invite them to do so. Its members include profilers, criminologists, forensic scientists, medical examiners, active and retired law enforcement agents, prosecutors, polygraph examiners, and others that are skilled in solving cases. That's the shit that's cool as heck. It's so phenomenal. Like, when I found it, I was like, oh my gosh, I need to know more. I was like all over their site. <laughs> But um, they say that the investigation remains under the full control of the investigating agency, and the society will offer assistance on the case. Neither the society nor their members will seek public recognition, uh, public recognition or compensation for their work. The society can't accept all cases due to limited resources, but they do have very specific criteria. Um, the victim must not have engaged in criminal activity that caused their death. And at a minimum, the case needs to have a body, a known crime scene, and physical evidence. I mean, that's fair. Absolutely. Tom Brennan hired forensic pathologist Wayne Ross to examine a fragment of Ellen's spinal cord, which the medical examiner's office was still in possession of. In 2017, Wayne Ross concluded that Ellen's cranial cavity had been punctured, which would have likely rendered her unconscious, which would have prevented her from stabbing herself so many times. And would have prevented her from fighting back. There you go. Uh, Brennan recalled that, quote, you could plainly see the nerves were severed. She would have lost her motor skills and been in excruciating pain. She would have likely passed out or died. The Inquirer also contracted their own independent medical experts to assess the evidence. Gregory McDonald, a Montgomery County coroner and the dean of the School of Health Science at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, was one of them. Um, but he found himself on the fence between suicide and homicide. He focused on Ellen's stab wounds and how shallow they were. And he said, quote, typically when we see a series of shallow stab wounds, they could be consistent with hesitation marks. I could see that. Mm -hmm. He says when someone is self-inflicting these wounds, oftentimes they'll stab themselves superficially first to kind of see what it feels like to them. And then they'll go deeper and deeper as they progress with their self-inflicted wounds. And that's a lot of wounds still, though. A lot of, lot of testing right. there. Yeah. He did say that shallow stab wounds are uncommon in homicides, though. McDonald said, quote, typically if a person is stabbing you, they're not going to stab you several times superficially and then start to stab you deeper. It's possible... But that's one of those things that struck me as not being consistent with homicide. McDonald said he was conflicted, though. He noted the deeper stab wounds, the number of punctures, and a gash that was also found on Ellen's forehead, which complicated things because that would appear like she was attacked by, you know, a knife, another person. McDonald said, quote, you can stab yourself fairly deeply in a lot of different areas of your body. She could have done it physically, of course, but it's unusual to stab yourself that many times 
that deeply in those areas. McDonald also pointed out that Ellen's stab wounds were through her clothing, which is not often indicative of suicide. He said, quote, most people who commit suicide don't stab themselves through the clothes. They usually pull the clothes up and usually expose whatever area they want to target. So that was a little unusual for a suicide. He said that he's worked hundreds or perhaps thousands of suicide investigations, and Ellen's case is one of the most unusual he has ever seen in his career. Now, Tom Brennan said, quote, the best way to get away with homicide is to have it ruled a suicide. And he's absolutely correct. And it's true. Now, Tom is a private detective, it's, and he says it's nearly impossible for the victim's families to legally challenge a manner of death ruling by a medical examiner or coroner in Pennsylvania. He has been pressing hard to get Ellen's manner of death changed. The Greenbergs are incredibly disappointed with the investigation. Ellen's parents said that they found it strange that she would fill up her vehicle with gas before going to her apartment if she was planning to end her life that day. And why would she cut up the fruit on the counter? <laughs> right. Yeah. Now, her father, Joshua, says, quote, it doesn't sound logical, does it? It doesn't fit. They feel that the authorities have failed them. And the attorney general never reached out to them or any of their experts during the investigation. And her father said, quote, it's very frustrating, very emotionally frustrating, emotionally hurtful. Sometimes I feel like somebody's punched me in the stomach. We have these steel doors or walls that keep coming up in front of us every time we try to do something, every time we try to get an answer. Ellen's parents have filed two lawsuits, one of which is aimed at convincing a court to overturn the suicide ruling, allowing a full investigation of her death. Yes. If they succeed, it would be the first time a medical examiner's ruling in such a case was successfully challenged in Pennsylvania. Wow. And this is um, said per Joseph Pedraza, one of the Greenberg's attorneys. And I mean, that to me is like crazy sauce. Are you kidding me? It shouldn't be this difficult. Like if there's a problem. No, it shouldn't. You're right. They should be allowed to challenge this. In 2018, new computer forensic evidence that was not referred to in the 2011 findings stated that there was a search history on Ellen's computer showing that she looked up things that included suicide methods, quick suicide, and painless suicide. In 2011, investigators said there wasn't anything on Ellen's computer that was related to suicide. So now there's a new search history? Yeah. Huh. And it's like... Okay, huh? does that mean that they never looked in the first place at that computer? Because a search history is going to be pretty easy to figure it's out. It's true. So that tells me they looked at it, said suicide, ah, we're not even going to bother looking. You could probably tell the entire, like, day I've had based on my Google, like, history. <laughs> yeah. I just all day I'm like, what is this? What does this do? I How ask, does this work? Yeah. Where is this? Who is this person? <laughs> I literally <laughs> ask questions all day long. Yeah, Random you, things yeah. pop in my head and I'm like, oh, I got to know. I got to know. Yeah, you'd be able to piece my day together. No problem. You'd be like, oh, this is what she was doing at this point. Easy peasy. Yes. But that's really frustrating that in 2011, there right. was nothing suicide related. Now in 2018, Suddenly oh, yeah. Is. Yeah. She did look up things. Yeah. What? Brennan said that when he took the case two years after Ellen's death, he was intrigued by the photos from the scene showing the apartment's internal door latch. Wait, I'm so sorry. I just, my brain Go just caught it. up again. But Kay. like, um, y you said she looked up what? She looked up easy, fast ways? Uh, yeah. So it was suicide methods, quick suicide, and painless suicide. Okay, how the fuck is any of what sh she allegedly did any of what she looked up aside from the suicide no that's exactly it right. is not quick it is not less pain or like not painful i yeah. mean like 
what? No, I I agree completely. What? That was, um, I think in like the last part when we go back over it, that was one of the points that I made is like, um, hello, this is not any of those things. It is definitely not. And if you're Googling it, you're like that you're looking for it to be that. Right. You're not looking to do the exact opposite. And then it makes me wonder, did somebody else Googled on her computer? Well, it was a combination of two things. It was either that or did somebody know that she was potentially considering suicide and looking into different methods and thought that they could stage it that way? Yep. Because how easy would that be if she's already Googling it? Yep. You know? I don't know. And I mean, if you use somebody else's computer, like if I went and used yours, I would be able to see your search history. I would know what's going on. No, yeah, it's true. I just... So if it's one that they both could access or somebody else, I'm not saying it's just Sam that had access to it. Yeah, anybody. Anybody had access to that computer, could somebody have made it look that way? Because that just does not line up. It doesn't. So Brennan, Tom Brennan said that he was very interested in um, that internal door latch Sam told the 911 operator and the police that he opened the door by breaking the latch. Brennan says it's his professional opinion that the limited number of police and medical examiner photos from the scene would say otherwise. He says, quote, the state police sent me to lockpicking school. I used to do all the surreptitious entries. The only way you can open that lock is if one or the other piece is completely dismounted from where it's mounted. Okay. That bar isn't going to open up for you any other way. In the photos, Brennan says that the latch is only partially dislodged. Both sides of the latch are still fastened to the door and the jam with multiple screws. Quote, three of those screws are still mounted. There's one that's out. He concluded that the damage to the latch wasn't extensive enough for the apartment door to have been broken open. Two separate crime scene experts hired by the Greenbergs came to similar conclusions after viewing the photos of the door latch. The Henry C. Lee Institute of Forensic Science at the University of New Haven states in a written report, quote, some damage appears to be in the area of this lock in the close-up photograph. There does not appear to be damage to the door jam or evidence of a break-in at the deadbolt lock from the other side of the door. A second report was completed by Detective Scott Eelman, a veteran detective and a court-qualified expert on crime scene analysis and blood spatter, and he states, quote, There is damage noted to the door side of the security latch, which is still attached to the door. The screws are still present in the screw hole. The door jam side of the security latch does not appear to show any damage. Sam Goldberg and his family have declined for a long time to comment on this case. In August of 2022, a letter from their family attorney, Jeffrey R. Johnson, was sent in a response to a media account that says the family has, quote, maintained a respectful silence on the terrible events of that day while law enforcement authorities have done their job and concluded correctly that Ellen's death was a suicide. In his letter, the attorney said, quote, Ellen Greenberg was taking a variety of powerful psychotropic drugs, which unfortunately caused suicidal ideation as a side effect. Um, excuse me, how can you make a claim like that? You cannot. You don't know. And that infuriates me that they would submit a letter like that and flat claim that it was the the drugs that caused this can we just say like i feel like mental health makes it easier for somebody to come after you for something like that because like oh she was on meds so side effect and excuse me she had not been on the medications for long and also if you really want to know these search histories are from before she got on the medication that is really weird yeah so try me again with okay that one. that's really 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 weird because they mm-hmm. were all saying before she even had the med issues like 
or before she had to get put on meds, like she was not like she had behavior change. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. She sure did. Interesting. Okay. Oh, but, man. but yeah, I mean, okay. we we just don't know if this medication had that kind of side effect. No, for we her. don't. So I don't think it's fair to make that claim. It's not. And they're not even saying this could have happened. They're no, like, oh no, this said, is what it this is. This is what happened. Yeah. And I just I don't like that. When the police arrived on the scene, they questioned Sam Goldberg for three hours, and then later that night at at police headquarters, and this was all done without an attorney present. In the letter, the attorney wrote, quote, at all times that night and subsequently, Sam Goldberg has fully cooperated with the police investigation. He has never asserted any privilege and has never refused to speak with the police. Tom Brennan looked through the photos of Ellen's body taken by the medical examiner's representative at the scene. Her body was slumped in a sitting position, but he noticed a horizontal line of dried blood on her face. Police and medical examiner photos taken at the scene show coagulated blood running straight across to her ear. The blood should have run down her face based on the position that she was found. She was sitting slumped oh, yeah. against the cabinets. Blood goes down. It's called gravity. Well, and I know you don't know what this is, but, like, when anybody who's cried while laying down knows exactly where those tears go, they go straight to yours. <laughs> I don't know what. What is crying? I know. I just, I'm crazy. Like, I know. Why are you leaking? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's not just Brennan that feels this way either. Similar findings were made by the two independent crime scene and forensic analysts who reviewed the case for the Greenbergs. And that was one of the things that Henry Lee was alluding to when he was talking about the blood on her face when we were going through his report. Detective Eelman wrote, quote, Miss Greenberg was found in the corner of the kitchen area of the apartment between the sink and stove. Her back was leaning against the corner cabinet. She was slumped downward with her feet and arms extended. Her head was found to be tilted slightly forward and to the right, with her chin resting against her right shoulder. The blood stains on her face are inconsistent with the position in which she was found. Specifically, the blood stain flow pattern diagonally across her forehead from the right to the left and terminating in the left eyebrow would move against the law of gravity. It is my opinion that the bloodstain evidence in this case is inconsistent with the position in which Miss Greenberg was found. The number and type of wounds and bloodstain patterns observed are consistent with a homicide scene. So, we've got another expert saying homicide. We hearing that? Okay. We're hearing it. <laughs> I mean, we are. We are. I don't know about everyone else. <laughs> Right. And I I will acknowledge, I know a lot of people still think that this is a suicide case, and that's fine. Like, you, everyone's entitled to their own opinions. However, I I am going to side here with what the experts are are seeing, because they have all the evidence. evidence is pointing to. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. The autopsy showed that Ellen suffered 11 stab wounds to the back of her head and neck, which are not visible in the photos. Only a limited number of photos were actually taken at the crime scene because they did not work it as a homicide. Because they thought it was a suicide. Yes. It's important to know about all of the individual wounds on Ellen's body. The stab wounds were done with a steak knife and the wounds were labeled with letters. So we are going to get into that now. Wounds. It was a a steak knife. A steak knife. Yeah, because she had a uh, um. That's right. It it was. Yeah, that's right. It came out of the knife lock. Yes. So wounds A and B on her chest were 0.2 centimeters. Wound C is 1.4 centimeters, slightly right to left stroke. Wound D is 0.2 centimeters. E is 10 centimeters. Almost the entire blade went in, and it was left to right in a downward stroke. Her lungs would have been filling up with blood from this wound. F is 0.2 centimeters, 
G is 0.2 centimeters. H is 4 centimeters and 2.3 centimeters into the liver, leading to bleeding into the abdominal space, and it was left to right. I is 6 centimeters in the abdomen and left to right. J is 6.5 centimeters in the scalp. K is 0.3 centimeters left to right, back to front. So that means that knife had a lot of motion in this one. L is 0.2 centimeters left to right, back to front. So again, a lot of motion. M is 0.3 centimeters back to front. N is 8 centimeters deep, which led to bleeding on the brain, and it was left to right, back to front, and upwards. It's not impossible, but it would be so awkward and difficult for Ellen to do this herself. O is 3 centimeters right to left, back to front. P is 2.1 centimeters right to left and back to front. Q, 2 centimeters left to right, back to front. R, 1.9 centimeters left to right, back to front. S, is 2.1 centimeters left to right, back to front. T, 7 centimeters between the second and third cervical vertebrae hitting the spinal cord. Now just think about how long that took me to read through those and imagine how long all of that took if she did it herself. Wouldn't it's just like and none all of them of are the motion. None of them are in like one spot. Right. And it's moving. Every everywhere. single one of those was like damaging blows. And that would have been so much fucking pain. Yeah. Like the bleeding into the lungs, the liver, like. I mean, literally just bleeding out internally. And and you're still able to like keep stabbing yourself. The, yeah, these are very damaging. I feel like, you know, even when you're determined, like, there comes a point where you can't handle that pain. Right. You would think so. Absolutely. Where you just wanted to stop. Yeah. Or you would, your body would probably like, want to pass out. Right. At the very your least, Your body you would forces think. you to stop. Or, yeah. Yeah. Now, she did have bruises. Um, so we'll go through those. Three by four centimeter bruise was on her upper right arm. Three by 1.5 centimeter of three round bruises on her right forearm. Three by three and a half centimeter on her right lower quadrant of the abdomen. Vertical row of round bruises of 2.5 by three centimeter, 4.5 by three centimeter, and five by six centimeter on her abdomen. Four and a half by three centimeter area of three round bruises above the right knee. Now, God, could you imagine if you had to go through my bruises? You'd be reading the list for like a fucking month. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you walk into everything and fall on everything, so that'd take a while. Um, it would be so bad. <laughs> now, the police said that her bruises. Could have been from contact sports. So we're going to address that here. Um, She didn't play any. (laughs) Sorry. That that was not what I expected. Um, She played them in college. Okay. She did not at the time of her death. Well, that answered that. So um, she did yoga. I'm not really sure that. Yoga is something you get all bruised up bruised up for. during. Uh, I think it's supposed to be a little calmer than that, from my understanding of it. I mean, maybe when you're learning new stuff, but I really don't think you're supposed to come out of that bruised. Right. And I just want to make a statement that you might want to know your victim's background before tossing out such an asinine theory. That's a good point. Because that is very damaging to put that kind of stuff out there. Yeah. So I'm not down with it, and I just want to make sure we go over it. So she did not get that from contact sports. There we go. Yeah, me either. I just run into fucking everything. Everything. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Uh, 
Well, it's not your fault that the walls move all the time. I know they do. Yeah. And the freaking counters. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. The counters. Yeah, I can't blame you for that. And the cupboards just open themselves. Sure do. Yeah. I know. It's freaking rude. <laughs> it is. The Greenbergs consulted Dr. Wayne K. Ross, a veteran forensic and neuropathologist based in Lancaster, who often conducts autopsy for county coroners. He reviewed the case and wrote, quote, It is my opinion that the investigating authorities should pursue this case as a homicide. It is further my opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty that the manner of death is a homicide. The scene findings were indicative of a homicide. Well, Jesus, what is it going to take me gathering all of them on a fucking mountain so they can scream it? Right. I mean... Like, shit. How many people have to say... That our professional have to be like, don't treat this as a suicide and for them to not treat it like a fucking suicide. Not only professional, but like big, big, big time professionals. Right. Anybody who is even slightly well versed in true crime cases will notice that these names we've heard a lot. Yeah. So uh, I don't know what they need here either. But Cyril Wecht said, quote, It is my professional opinion that the manner of death of Ellen Greenberg is strongly suspicious of homicide. He cited the lack of suicide note, which he called unlikely. Um, and the suicidal stab wounds are unlikely. He, he said that it's unlikely that she would stab herself in the back of her lower head and upper neck. And also he cited that you wouldn't typically see um, someone stabbed through their clothing. And it's a rarity to have multiple wounds in a suicidal stabbing. Brennan noted that he approaches death investigations with one rule. Quote, you treat every death scene as a homicide yes. until proven otherwise. Yes. Do I need to say it for the people in the back? And that is why, like, <gasps> uh, yeah, that's why when you're like, oh, they didn't take pictures enough because they were treating it like a suicide. Well, it doesn't fucking matter. It, it should have been treated like a homicide no matter what. Yes. And I, th- I think that for anything, it should be just in case, because even if it's solid as shit, there's always that chance. And if later it comes out that there is a chance, well, now you don't have the fucking evidence because you chose not to do you're, it. Yeah, you're missing key pieces. Like, are you kidding me? The Philadelphia pathologist, Dr. Marlon Osborne's autopsy conducted the day after Ellen's death, cited, quote, multiple stab wounds by an unknown person. He ruled her death as a homicide. By the time his ruling had changed the case, investigators had already left Ellen's apartment on January 26th without sealing it as a crime scene. The apartment was cleaned and sanitized the very next day, and that was before... The detectives and their forensic team secured a search warrant and returned on January 28th. Yep. How can that even happen? Yep. Both the apartment management and Sam Goldberg's father, Richard, called the police on January 27th, asking for instructions on how to clean the bloodied apartment. The police referred both of them to a company that specializes in crime scene sanitation. Wow. It's really nice. Well, and just to clarify, they, they're they not doing anything wrong because the police were saying, hey, this was a suicide case. So it's like, you right, can't just they, leave the apartment like that. But again. I'm saying it's not the apartment manager's fault. Oh, no, I'm it's not the apartment manager's here. fault. No, okay. no, 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 no. It's not no, the apartment the police manager's are, fault. No, the police are, sorry, I, I don't like to jump on the bandwagon of police do everything wrong. But in this case, this is not correct. Right. There's a lot of big problems happening here. So James Schwartzman, Sam's attorney uncle, also entered the apartment on Sam's behalf to grab him a suit for the funeral. And while he was there, he took three laptops, Ellen's cell phone and credit cards belonging to Sam and Ellen to keep them safe. Um, um, okay. Weird? Yep. Yeah. Okay. 
Why? I don't know. Safe from what? I, You know, I honestly have no idea what is happening here. Her cards? Yep. What the f- And her phone? And her laptop. The two of them are not married. So I guess, like, I would think that that stuff should actually be going to her parents. Weird. It's but very I'm, weird. I'm not sure on how that works legally. So don't quote me on that. It just feels weird. Um, it, it at least should be talked about, probably, you know. Now, he did hand over the items to the police when he was asked. But, I mean, submitting any of the removed items as evidence at a court proceeding could cause a problem because yep. he was in possession of them before the police were. Yep. On April 4th, 2011, Marlon Osborne, the pathologist who performed the autopsy and ruled Ellen's death as a homicide, amended her death certificate, officially changing the manner of death to suicide. Ellen's death ruling was changed after a meeting among police, at least one prosecutor and two medical examiner officials. This ruling was used to shut down the homicide investigation, but the Greenbergs didn't give up, and that's what led them to Tom Brennan in 2013. As he reviewed the case, he saw a number of inconsistencies right away. The door latch, the dried blood on her face, and the bruises on Ellen's wrists. The police said there was a lack of defense wounds, but Brennan said, quote, I'm looking at the autopsy photographs. I take a look at the victim's wrists. Both wrists show trauma. He believes that he has overwhelming amounts of evidence that Ellen was killed. But why are the Philadelphia officials fighting so hard to stop this? Seth Williams was Philadelphia's district attorney when Ellen's body was discovered in 2011. But after the ruling was changed on her manner of death, The Greenbergs got a lawyer named Larry Krasner to look into things. In 2017, Larry was elected Philadelphia's DA, meaning there was now a conflict of interest, so he could not work on their case any longer. Heading the office at that time was Josh Shapiro, and the Greenbergs accused him and his lieutenants of sitting on the case the entire time. The attorney general's office released a statement in 2022 defending their work and claimed that they conducted an exhaustive review, but they cited the conflict of interest and they returned the case to Philadelphia, meaning the Greenbergs were starting all over again. When Philadelphia got the case, they were defending two civil lawsuits filed by the Greenberg family. One was seeking to overturn the official ruling of suicide. If granted, it would reopen the death investigation and all evidence collected by their private detective could be brought to court. The second suit was for monetary damages. They were accusing members of the Philadelphia Police District Attorneys and Medical Examiner Offices of, quote, individual and willful misconduct and participating in a conspiracy to cover up the murder of Ellen. The police and assistant medical examiner at the scene ruled her case a suicide that night, based on the January 26th incident report. It was ruled a homicide the next day based on the autopsy. That's when police tried to go back to the apartment on the 28th, but it was cleaned and sanitized. So there's nothing, nothing that they can do. So, are we all aggravated? did mean like (sighs) sitting here shaking my head continuously not give you that vibe yeah no i'm i'm getting it so i know that this was a lot of reports this week so we're gonna end it on you know here but next week um tom brennan learned about a secret call that led to changing ellen's manner of death to suicide so we're gonna find out about that The Greenbergs discovered that the medical examiner's office kept a piece of Ellen's spinal tissue. That's fucking weird. Mm Mm-hmm. And I I don't actually know. I think that some places do keep small specimens of things, but they were not aware of this up front. Um, yeah, and I'm not really sure you're supposed to 
do that in these types of situations. I guess I'm not sure. I don't know exactly how that works. Yeah. Um, we're also going to talk about a 3D analysis that was done to show the trajectory and depth of all 20 wounds. Okay. And we are going deeper into the timeline of what happened on the day of Ellen's death. And this will include a statement from the security guard that Sam used as his alibi. Okay, I would love to hear that. So you better come back next week because we have a lot to go over. Well, I will be here, so. Yeah, you will. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so make sure to follow us on any of your podcast apps. Tell us the stories you want to hear. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Leave us a five-star review if you love us. Tell your friends. Tell your cats. Um, bye. bye.